morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our town board meeting of Tuesday, May 23rd. Can I please have a motion to open the town board meeting? Motion to open town board meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, uh, Jill, any announcements? Uh, just really quickly, if you uh, haven't noticed, our porta potty is gone. <laughs> Yay. Um, and uh, uh, many thanks to uh, Chip, Walter, uh, Dan Rubino, and Dave for a fabulous remodel of our downstairs handicapped family bathroom. It looks amazing. Uh, now on to the ladies' room downstairs that also needs a rehab desperately. So thanks so much. Um, and uh, just a quick note that uh, summer hours for Town Hall start uh, the first week in June, so that first Friday, um, we will be closing at 3.15 uh, through um, Labor Day. So, thanks so much. Right, thank you. Um, my supervisor's report, you'll all be able to read, but I do have a couple things I wanted to announce. First, uh, this coming weekend is Memorial Day, and we have our parade on Monday, uh, starting at 11 o'clock, but at 10.30 at Victory Corners is our, our uh, commemoration on memorial service there um, and then the parade will kick off at 11 so we hope everyone will join um, also you will see we are wearing orange today um, and we have our rally against gun violence will be held on um, June 1st at 6 p.m. at the gazebo um, and June 3rd is our pride flag raising as well as um, supper on center is uh, that weekend as well so um, everyone put those on your calendars and there's a lot going on, but I hope to see you this weekend. Um, in terms of Community Corner, I did want to wish a happy sixth birthday to Kara Sokol. Um, so we wish you a very happy day. And that's about it. Anything else from the administrator's report? No. Okay. So we are going to move right on to public comment new business. Not relating, by the way, to the 50 North Greeley. That will be part of our public hearings. This is just new business. Come on up. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, orange is good. I really wasn't aware of it, so I'm not in orange. But uh, We're it, it, it's good. You can wear it June second to fourth is where Orange Weekend, so you can wear it those days. Okay, well, I I am kind of related to a pumpkin. <laughs> That'll work, <laughs> but no carving allowed. Thank you. Um, I did want to uh, talk about uh, one of my favorite issues today, which is what can we do to make the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center, everything it could be. So I hadn't heard anything, so I went ahead and did some stuff anyway. Okay. And uh, uh, a couple of things. The, the key to using a venue and to making it what, it what it can be is, first of all, to do it. And the second second thing is, uh, uh, a lot of say, said it couldn't be done, but I, poor fool, not knowing that, went ahead and did it anyway. So with that, uh, that in mind, uh, we can talk about, anybody know a Ch Chinese Republican? No. Chinese, this weekend, I, we migrated around um, various theater projects. And this is the, uh, there's something called uh, the, uh, the, se the, the second, second stage. And the second stage does previews. So one of the things that I did, we attended Asians sitting up on stage and reading a brand new play for the second time that they hadn't they had done. And what they do is they just go up and they read it, see if they like it. Theater starts by practicing, testing, practicing, testing. And as I've been saying before, every night that we don't have an event at the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center, we're not only losing revenue, but we're losing prestige. Making Chappaqua just 
a center. Doesn't have to be Connecticut for new shows that haven't yet started. This is the thing to do. So uh, yesterday I talked to uh, the uh, Lindsay Fortin, who is the uh, chief development officer at Second Stage. They have multiple theaters. So yesterday's event was at the Tony Kaiser Theater, which has about as many seats as as this particular venue, and they were going through a reading of it. And they happen to be Asians, and I have pictures. All Asians goes into the the Asian events that that have been practiced recently. Why not? Why not here? So I answered. So why not here? He said, "Hey, that's a great idea. Let's do it." So somebody's got to make a phone call. They're not going to call you. <laughs> that's it. The key to selling anything is get on the phone and make the call. Because if you don't, nothing will happen. And another event this weekend that was at a, at another function. This was uh, a program called Music for Humanity. It was a joint concert from the Hudson Corral and the Westchester Choral Society. First time they, they've sort of like done together. It's a lot of voices. Um, just the relatives alone will fill the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center. But there's always a reason why you can't have it here because we don't have this. Can't have it here because we haven't done that. Let's make it happen. I would like to love to hear from those folks. I'd love to see it promoted. And I'd love everybody in this audience and anybody who's watching on television, come to something at the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center. It's important because that's how uh, we can we can allow things to do. And there are many, many more arts organizations uh, that are here. But if you don't make the call, it's not going to happen. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you, Don. All right, any other public comment? Your business. OK, any online? Hi, Helen. You can unmute yourself. Helen, your hands raised. All right. Well, I think we're having technical difficulties. Can she get on? Can you unmute her? She has to unmute herself. All right, well, please email the board if there's anything that we can do for you because we cannot hear you. You have to unmute yourself. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on. Okay, so next on our agenda is a public hearing for uh, the North Greeley Net Zero uh, Carbon Legislation, which is why I'm sure most of you are here tonight. Can I please have a motion to uh, open the public hearing? It's been adjourned. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so before we get started again, I, I was so pleased with um, the tenor of the last public hearing, and I know the, the rest of the town board was too. So I want to remind everyone, the town board has not made up uh, our mind on anything. The reason we have these public hearings is because we want to hear from the public, because that will inform potentially changes to the project as well as decisions that are going to be made. We do not have a time limit. Um, before I took office a decade ago, there was a three, limit, three minute timer. We don't have that anymore, but we do ask people to please be respectful of time. There are a lot of people here tonight. Um, and to please be respectful of other people's opinions. Uh, somebody may or may not agree with you. That's okay. We like diversity of opinion. We like uh, all of us to be collaborative. So I would just please ask everyone to be respectful of, of everyone's thoughts and opinions at, when they get up here to speak. Um, Jill, do we have the cards again? 
Yes, they're out. Okay. Sorry. So if you would like to speak, there are um, index cards over there on the back table. If you would write your name and address on them and hand them over to this table, and then they'll make their way up to us so we can just do this in an, in an orderly manner um, rather than everyone raising their hand. Uh, before we start, um, Ed, is there anything you want to go through on the uh, legislation itself, potentially? Not the legislation, but I thought we ought to mention uh, the receipt of the memo today, which is actually mm -hmm. already in the packet um, that includes the animation that the town board requested at the last uh, session of the public hearing. And all that will be also posted on the town website. It's on there already. It's on there already. Okay. Are you, are, is the applicant going to show that video again? We can. It was, we'll have the same lagging issues through Zoom as we did last time. So if you optimize, I think you did. We, we, we tried earlier. We did. Okay. So um, folks at home can look at the YouTube link. It would seamlessly, and it's as you said it's available on the website. We can look at a full quality version of it here today. I think fine. we should, even sure. though we, we understand it's poor quality that it's it gets a little laggy. Sure. Um, but it will be a better version online that's already posted on on our website for everyone to see. Uh, all right. So, Nanette, was there anything you wanted to talk about before, from the applicant perspective? Sure, I'm Nanette Warren, and I'm a planning consultant for the development team, and we mentioned um, uh, at the end of the meeting last time that we really didn't talk about the zoning. Uh, the conversation was primarily about the project. So I thought it would be helpful if we at least went through the, um, the background, some of the structure of the zoning. And um, basically to develop something like Andrew um, talked about last time, it requires enabling legislation to, um, to make the, that possible. And what we did was we, we submitted a petition to the town board to create a zoning district that would um, enable this kind of a project. And what we did was we created the net zero, the North Greeley net zero special permit or the NG-0. And it was um, intended to add a special permit to chapter 60, uh, 430 of the permitted uses. And the NG-0 is designed to implement the goals and the policies of the comprehensive plan update <clears throat> regarding transit oriented development, uh, creating a more diverse uh, housing stock, including both affordable housing as well as uh, workforce housing. It was uh, designed to serve as a more rigorous adherence to environmentally sustainable building construction and design uh, to address individual properties uh, on the uh, west side of Greeley that may not be uh, contributing in a positive way to the downtown environment. And we tried as best as possible to use existing zoning structure both in your special permits as well as your overlay districts uh, to to um, to mimic that um, a cornerstone of the ng-0 um, as i said is a rig rigorous adherence to achieving an uh, environmentally sustainable building and this means that uh, as stated in the in the code the draft code that, that construction must incorporate green building practices to minimize on-site generation of carbon emissions, no gas or fossil fuel fired equipment or appliances, uh, with the exception of backup, uh, incorporating uh, renewable energy systems to achieve net zero carbon emissions, uh, minimize embodied uh, carbon in building products and materials, to utilize uh, the reuse of, encourage the reuse of, of salvage materials as, as much as possible, and to improve energy efficiency and building resiliency. And based on that, uh, the site plans that follow that would, would need to have certain characteristics. And a summary of those characteristics that are included in the draft code include components that activate the street with, um, with retail and housing and restaurants and cafes, not parking lots. Uh, to have a visual character that contributes to the neighborhood with wide sidewalks, attractive landscaping, attractive street furniture and illumination, uh, height limit of four stories or 50 feet, 
uh, providing 10% uh, of affordable workforce housing, um, minimizing or prohibiting this long uninterrupted uh, street wall of building and to have a minimal shadow impact on the existing uses. Uh, there are parking provisions uh, that, uh, as currently proposed, relates to the provision of, of uh, on-site shared parking that would reduce the demand for on-site parking, uh, primarily as, as it's currently written, um, one parking space per unit for the residential units and additional parking for the commercial uses. Uh, with um, reference to utilities, adequate water, sewer, refuse. And we looked in, as far as the, um, the approvals process to, to um, mimic some of the, um, the, the structures and the processes that are already included in the town, some of your overlay districts, as well as your existing workforce housing, which is also in the downtown. So that's just a brief overview of what's, uh, what's currently in the code, the draft code. Anything, any questions? No. Nope. All right, thank you. So um, I think, Andrew, if you want to present that walkthrough and if there's anything else that uh, the, the applicant wanted to present, um, and then we'll open it up for public comment. Uh, Andy Ruff with the Bearing Against Architecture. Uh, so we have uh, two animations that have been submitted to the town board. Um, the first is the same one that we shared uh, on May 9th uh, with the addition of some uh, annotations to help orient those um, um, with the aerial view, which I believe is the one that's on the screen now if that wants to be played. later you can toggle the playback speed um, and so um, out of consideration of everyone's time we, we kept the length the same but that can be slowed down at certain moments or for the entire duration uh, as you feel necessary um, and then there's a second one which doesn't need the, the music if we can avoid it um, uh, which shows uh, if you can start this one from the beginning So this is uh, what was requested last week, which is uh, coming down King Street uh, and then turning right uh, up towards North Greeley um, at the pedestrian. Uh, so this is right. where the traffic light would be. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. And so that's Susan Lawrence right there in front of you uh, with the North Greeley proposed building there on the right. This is all posted on the website also. Yeah. Um, so the YouTube videos are on the website. Uh, we can also provide the native video files if anyone wants the, the raw, um, quite large files. Um, we're happy to provide that as well. Um, whatever the town public would like to best review these animations. I have a question for you. I'm assuming this is all to scale. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a, an optical illusion. It just seems a little bit elongated. Uh, when I look at the pocket park, that's the little park mm -hmm. next to Susan Lawrence. Um, and maybe it's bigger than I realize, but it looks bigger on this. Like it looks kind of elongated. Sure. So and if it is, it would make all the spaces look a little 
bit wider and more spacious. Sure, everything yeah. is to scale, um, and is the exact same digital model that was used to create this right. physical model. So, um, any distortion that <laughs> might be perceived is simply a function of um, translating binocular vision to a <laughs> wide format camera. Um, the same effect that you have in a movie. Um, but did, did that in fact happen? Is no, that, it's is that just, I, yeah, yeah, there's no um, artificial elongation of the lens. It is just the standard view um, that comes out of the animation software. Um, no, there's no distortion that we input. No, not in, I, mean, I wouldn't suggest you intentionally did that. Mm -hmm. Is that something that just, um, sort of a, a, an elongation that just comes about from the program? I, I, I don't know that it's elongated. Uh, like if you go back sure, and you but look it was at the, done to scale. It's, it's done to scale. Absolutely to scale. If yes. you want to see what I'm talking about, it's the point at which you get to the little pocket park right before Susan Lawrence. Okay. And as you pass it, mm -hmm. you can see that it just seems to get bigger, longer. There it is. That is to scale. That's the, uh, according to the GIS information, you know, it looks just so big is it's fun. not it's it's not taking into account like the um, seating area behind Basso and thing. Yeah, it, 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 it didn't look. It looks deeper than it is. It's not the depth. It's the width. The width. And maybe, like I said, maybe it's bigger than I would. So recollect what this is. Susan Lawrence building. Oh, that, that's the, the, the pocket, pocket park, park right before Susan Lawrence. And, and as you continue on, it just it just seems rather um, larger. Sure. So so we built this based off of available JS information and New York State LiDAR for topography. Right. Um, it, we're happy to modify this. If there's any inaccuracies, if the town can provide us with a survey of that space, we're more than happy to provide it. That's outside of our property scope. Um, so to the best of our ability, we probably Yeah, it. I'm not so much concerned sure. about the, the park in the visuals of the park itself mm -hmm. as uh, I would be if there is some sort of, um, you know, programmatic occurrence where things do get elongated, whether it would have an impact so. on the way the buildings. Appear. I don't believe so. I'll, I'll look, I'm happy to look into uh, the, yeah. the, kind of the camera settings in there, okay. but uh, there, there's nothing out of the ordinary in the way we develop this. Yeah. Well, to, to your point, okay. I, I thought that 50 North really looked longer than it really is in reality. Like that property, when you go down, it seems a lot longer. And in reality, I think it's a lot smaller. Which is, which is what happened to the park. Right, 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 exactly. I think it, it distorts it and makes it look bigger than it really is in terms of length. The length. And also, right, right. also the public spaces between the, the sections would make you know, we make those look longer as well. When you look at that, it looks, it looks a lot. It's quite long, yeah. right. I think we can solve this pretty easily and just go to Google Maps and show you that that park is as wide as it's shown on here. Yep. And, I think and it's just that you're going longer. slowly down the street, so you're seeing that image for a longer time. 437 feet it's, long. It's a quite long building. The spaces in between um, are 44 feet wide. So again, they're not small pocket courtyards. They are quite wide. Um, and they're, they're twice the width of a two-lane street for reference. Um, so again, that's why we try to show this in as many ways as possible, static renderings, animations, physical models, so that these questions of scale and perception can be examined in as many ways as you know are necessary. I mean, there it looks pretty normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Sure. So uh, in addition to this, we have, uh, we submitted the written response to questions um, that uh, Sabrina was kind of to consolidate for us. Uh, I'm happy to kind of walk through those. We have some visual supporting materials that I can briefly go through, and I don't know if anyone's had a chance to review those responses, but we can obviously answer any additional questions that are raised from that. Well, why don't you go through them, because I, I, we've had a chance to read it. I'm sure the public has not, so it would be it would help to inform everyone sitting here today as well as those Absolutely. listening online. But again, it is available on our website for anyone who uh, cares to take a deeper dive into it. There we go. Perfect. Um, so one of the questions uh, from May 9th was about building materials, uh, both in terms of the uh, structural building materials that we're proposing for the building as well as additional materials that are for whether it's for finishes or facade 
elements, uh, particularly in regards to durability and use. Um, and so I'll start with the, the primary structure. Uh, and for, for all of this, I have a basket of materials that everyone is more than happy to, to look at, because that was another request from last week. Um, so the, uh, the engineered timber systems that we're proposing for this building are an evolution of heavy timber construction, which has been utilized in North America since the mid-1800s. Um, and so, for example, these are, uh, on, on the left is a, a set of drawings from um, early 1900s showing what's called a mill building construction. On the right is um, a quite large, exist, still in existence, heavy timber frame building uh, in Minneapolis. The, the general premise of these buildings was that they would build the interior structure with, with heavy timber. In that case, old growth timber, which we no longer utilize, but it's timber nonetheless. And then around the perimeter, a non-combustible facade. Uh, and a lot of times they would use this for either warehouse or manufacturing. And the reason they used the timber was actually as a, as a fire safe solution. And so the non-combustible material around the perimeter was designed to protect your neighbors. If a fire was to break out in your building or to protect your building in case a neighbor, uh, neighbor's building uh, come on fire. On the interior, the timber was utilized to protect your own investment. Um, and so the, the benefit of mass timber or engineered timber is that the large cross section, when it does expose to fire, uh, it chars. And that charring creates an incident layer um, that is predictable and controllable and can be designed. And so it creates a very uh, predictable structure in the event of a fire, and one that's very safe for both, you know, whether it's materials being stored there or, in our case, occupants who are living there. Uh, Looking today, there, there are a number of ways in which we create engineered timber systems, and, and the, the broad reason for doing this is, is twofold. Uh, one is to uh, avoid the use of old growth forests. And so all, all these um, material technologies utilize um, faster growing, fairly small diameter trees. Uh, even for the uh, most sophisticated engineered timber panels that are 60 feet long, you're, you're not using a tree larger than 12 inches diameter, uh, just not really effective from the manufacturing process. Um, and because you're using uh, engineering to produce these members, you can introduce you know, lower quality fiber than would otherwise been required. So you're using faster growing, younger forests, and you're um, creating a more predictable, larger format material. Um, the way in which these are manufactured um, range from uh, glue lamp facilities, which um, the, this technology was developed in the 1910s in, in Switzerland. Uh, uh, this is a fairly manual process in most cases. Uh, uh, up to what is uh, a more contemporary evolution of this, which is across the timber panels that we've discussed previously, we've, we've samples up here. Um, this is the, you know, this has been around since the 1990s, uh, and the, the big difference here is that you're utilizing a two-way spanning member to replicate, you know, the strength of a concrete slab, um, but you're building out of wood, and then you're able to then machine it so that that machine in the center is actually profiling the panel, it's introducing um, the geometric profile, as well as um, pre-cutting for whether it's fasteners or penetrations for pipes. So this is a um, as much as possible moving the construction process to a factory and outside of the urban center. Uh, when it actually does come to site, um, typically it's just a flatbed truck, um, and then there's a small mobile crane that will lift it uh, either directly onto the building structure. Uh, or will stockpile it on site, in which case it's then immediately lifted into the building. The, the goal is that uh, with these systems, you can coordinate fairly just-in-time deliveries. Uh, and the other thing you'll notice in all these photos is the, the fairly small number of actual uh, construction workers on the site, because realistically, you have a truck driver, a uh, crane operator, and maybe four, four to five carpenters using screw guns. Uh, the panels are lifted into place, the mobile crane uh, fastened with uh, again, with, just with, with quite large, but, but at the end of the day, screws. Um, and the construction site, then you have the follow on uh, building envelope, kind of all the rest of the building that um, is familiar uh, for those who've seen mid rise construction. Uh, the big benefit here is, is not only the timber's environmental benefits, but as we discussed before, the potential to leverage prefabrication. Uh, and that extends from not only the building structure, but even into the envelope, in some cases, can be prefabricated. Um, and so this particular building, uh, up until last year, was the tallest mass timber building uh, in the world, which was an 18-story building in British Columbia. Uh, it was a student housing project. Uh, and this building went up 
uh, about a, a floor every three days. Um, and so this entire building core uh, structure and shell uh, was up in a matter of weeks um, for an 18-story building, and, and not to mention a very high seismic zone of that. Um, which kind of goes to one of the durability questions is, you know, is this material safe? Is this material durable and long-lasting? Uh, so this is a picture from last week. Uh, it is a 10-story mass timber building that was placed on the world's largest shake team, and it replicated a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Uh, it passed with flying colors. Uh, and so this is a, uh, the ductility and the um, ability for the timber to basically rebound its original shape uh, when stressed makes it a fantastic option for high stress environments, uh, even including blast testing. And so this is uh, uh, an image from the Department of Defense conducted blast testing back in 2016. Uh, these are three different CLT manufacturers, uh, and they exposed these to a series of air blasts at Tyndall Air Force Base. Uh, and now the Department of Defense uh, is utilizing mass timber construction uh, for some of, the, some of their bases. Uh, this is the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama they built uh, similar facilities at Fort Drum here in New York. Um, and so this is, uh, the robustness of this is um, more than sufficient for a four-story building. Um, and, and even industrial uses, and so this is a, this is a factory. Uh, you, um, and so it's, it's being utilized in kind of high wear, high stress environments, um, both in the kind of extreme events of a fire or an air blast, or in this case, just the day-to-day -day of uh, being in a, a manufacturing setting. Uh, additional materials that we've discussed uh, for the project, uh, so one of them is uh, use of masonry at the ground level uh, along the street, and, and one option that, that we would certainly consider, and I have samples up here, is, is that an upcycled or bio-based cementitious tile, uh, and so that would be um, a replacement for you know, either thin brick or, or full masonry veneer, and uh, these are taken from the waste stream, reprocessed, remanufactured, uh, so they're not only a um, have equal or better performance of traditional masonry products, they're uh, a dramatic improvement uh, over the, the carbon footprint of those products. Um, this is if you, this is this is in New York, so that entire facade is a, is an upcycled masonry facade um, on West 47th. Uh, one of the material systems we talked about for the, the exterior facade um, is a compressed paper panel, and so this is uh, there are a few different manufacturers of these, but the general uh, process is that it's a, a series of laminations of paper with a thermoset resin, um, basically everything that goes into this you can eat. Um, and so it's non uh, on-off gassing to the entire process. Uh, and it is incredibly resilient. The, you know, these are originally developed for the military. Uh, they, they're used in harsh salt water applications. Um, uh, this is the uh, shot of the manufacturing process. Again, it's just you know, rolls of craft paper. Um, and it produces this, this black color. In this case, is that is that panel. So incredibly resilient, incredibly sustainable, incredibly, well, one, basically one of the most durable facade panels that we can actually install on a building. Um, and it's even available in you know, different tones and uh, texture applications. Uh, so this is a, another version in, in Colombia that uses a similar product. Uh, and then finally, uh, we talked about engineered wood siding. And so there, there's, uh, from the past 15 years, uh, been a significant expansion in options and processes for enhancing uh, bio-based siding applications. So, so traditionally, you, you wouldn't use a bio-based siding in an urban environment. It just simply didn't have longevity or it needed uh, too much maintenance. And there have been a series of, uh, whether chemical or thermal processes, uh, that can be used. In this case, this is a, a, a thermally modified wood fiber, so that it goes into a kiln. It's baked at a, a 400 degrees with a fair amount of steam, um, and it uh, basically transforms the wood fiber into something that uh, insects don't really want to eat, and is incredibly durable. It gets a class one rating, so it's basically the most durable facade material that um, can be evaluated uh, with a minimum 25 year warranty with no maintenance. And, and the result is a facade that looks like timber, because it is timber, um, but it's been treated with heat and steam um, to basically prolong its, its effective lifespan. So low maintenance, high durability, that's a, and, and a really enhanced carbon benefit is really a through line to all the materials that we would consider uh, for the exterior of the building. Uh, There's also a fair number of questions about greener systems. Uh, and so uh, 
there, there are two primary types of green roofs. There's an intensive green roof, and so any of those familiar with the High Line in New York are familiar with um, a very intensive green roof system. You know, if, if you were to kind of crop the buildings on the side, you wouldn't really know if you were on, a, on an elevated structure or if you were in a park. And that's the, the point is that it's a very deep soil system that can support um, quite dense and high vegetation. Um, so that is a solution that we've discussed for the courtyards that would be accessible at level two for the residents. Uh, uh, and the other system that is quite common is called an extensive roof system. Uh, so this is the recently completed Javits Center renovation again in New York. Uh, had, I believe this is the largest extensive green roof in the world. Um, but the difference is that uh, the vegetation is, is quite low. Uh, and so this is limited by the depth of the soil. It's a different uh, kind of collection of species that would be utilized here. And one of the big differences besides height and depth of the soil is the amount of maintenance. Um, the whole goal of the uh, extensive roof, which, which typically uses a sedum planting, is to have um, high drought resistance minimal to no irrigation and minimal to no maintenance. Uh, and just for reference, uh, there are, this is a map of all the green roofs in the greater New York City area currently. Um, New York City recently passed a law um, requiring the local law to uh, require roof, new construction to have either green roof or solar roof. Uh, and so the, the density of green roof precedence um, in the immediate region is expanding rapidly. Uh, there are also some questions about um, the capacity for a slope roof to, um, to accept a, a green roof. And so there, here's a few examples. The, the basic uh, system is the same. The only difference is that um, there's instrument support underneath to take off the, the vertical loading. Uh, so basically it's, uh, it's a system that's designed to work on a sloping surface and there's certain gradients up to which it is you know, warranted and acceptable. Um, and you know, these are all over the world. It's a, it's a fairly common practice. Um, again, uh, you can really even see where the building is here on the left. That's a series of, of high school buildings that blends in with the surrounding landscape. Um, close to home, this is in uh, Lakeville, Connecticut. So this is the Hotchkiss School. Um, so an undulating, extensive green roof. Uh, so this is project has been, I think since 2012. Uh, and then it gets you know, quite large, even intensive uh, slope green roofs. This is in Vancouver, the Vancouver Convention Center. Um, the zigzags you've seen are actually mounds, and they, they have tractors that drive on the roof. So this is not <laughs> the scale that we're talking about here, but um, all to say that what we're uh, kind of proposing for the scale of this building is, is well within the bounds of um, precedent and technical capacity of these various green roof systems. Um, and then there was a discussion about how solar could be integrated into this. And so uh, when you introduce uh, rooftop mounted PV arrays onto a solar roof, it's, it's called a biosolar roof um, traditionally, and, and it has a, a couple of mutual benefits. And so uh, one of them is that the, uh, the solar panels will actually provide uh, differentiated climates, microclimates. And so you get a higher diversity of, of species that you can actually grow on that roof. So some that prefer more shade, some for more sun, and if those are flowering species, that increases you know, habitats for pollinators. Uh, and then the other uh, kind of technical benefits are that one is that when you mount a solar panel on a roof, um, traditionally it needs to be fixed through uh, a waterproofing membrane, and so every point in which the solar panel is fixed onto a roof, it's a weak point in the roof membrane. Uh, in this case, you could you can use the weight of the extensive green roof as ballast, and so the green roof is holding down. The solar panels, and so you you actually create a more durable roof system because it now you eliminate all the penetrations. Uh, and then the other one is that solar panels um, operate that they lose operational efficiency as they become too warm. And so in the summer, um, being mounted proximate to a green roof actually uh, stabilizes the air temperature around the solar panels and increases their efficiency um, as opposed to something that be mounted over, let's say, a, a, a black rubber roof. Um, there's a few, you know, there's many examples of these systems, um, uh, including a few here for reference, um, how these can be mixed in. And then in, in the written response, um, I can dive into te the technical differentiations of different on-site energy generation options. The, the, the summary is that um, uh, typically the solar panels that we would use for this are, are called monocrystalline solar panel 
uh, which are available kind of matte black and non-reflective. Um, and so it's, for those of you who are picturing you know, solar panels from 10, 20 years ago, the gridded kind of blue cells and that technology, um, polycrystalline technology, was not something that is common practice now, not what necessarily what we would advocate for um, in this building. So um, a, a more minimal aesthetic um, uh, for the actual solar panels. Andrew, can I ask you a question? Of course. What kind of maintenance is required for the type of green roof that you are proposing mm -hmm. at 50 North Greeley? Yep, so an extensive green roof, well, so the, the, there are two types. So the intensive courtyards, would be, you know, essentially gardens. And so, and those are readily accessible and those would be maintained like any other grounds uh, on a project development. The sloped roofs would be obviously less accessible, um, less visible, uh, and the goal would be to have an extensive green roof that requires very little to no maintenance. And so once established, an extensive green roof um, typically doesn't have to be maintained. Um, other than periodic check-ins, but the goal is to create a system that is appropriate for this climate, appropriate for this exposure, uh, and that once established is, um, yeah. So at your other properties that have green roofs, mm -hmm. who is doing the periodic check-ins? Part of the property management. Or, you know, yeah. I have them on buildings in the city, and our guys go once a year to just make sure it's fine. Mm -hmm. Our other buildings are down on them, and planted them in 2009, and we've never had to replant them. If planned properly. Yeah. So they plan properly. So, so those are the, the end of my, my photos. I, I can quickly summarize some other responses uh, to the questions that were raised. Uh, and so uh, just going through the list, uh, there was a number of questions about um, how delivery and access vehicles would um, interface with the site uh, and so as we responded you know, we have the ability to uh, move some things around the ground floor to accommodate a uh, single dedicated space that would be for um, a delivery whether it's uber eats or a service vehicle something that would be there intermittently uh, and so we can accommodate uh, one of those spaces on the site uh, without losing any of the other parking spaces dedicated to uh, resident or commercial Uh, there were some questions about construction sequence, so, so hopefully the, the photos of the mass timber uh, construction process help to elucidate how that might unfold. Uh, for this particular site, um, you know, that would ultimately be a decision in terms of how to sequence it uh, by the contractor. Um, but as I mentioned last time, we're working on a, a very similar geometric site in a very similar type of context. And conceptually, what we would propose here is to basically starting at the north and working the way towards the south. Uh, and then basically infilling the single story corridor structures at the end. So you preserve um, access ways for mobile crane that can reach into the entire depth of the property, um, keeping all the traffic off of North Greeley and all internals to the site. Um, there was a question about the quantification of the existing parking surfaces um, at, at the site. So, so currently, with the, the former Ready building, uh, there are 49 spaces, which include three ADA parking spaces. Um, we would propose increasing that total number of spaces um, by four for a total of 53 covered parking spaces plus one additional service space. Um, currently, the parking uh, occupies the, the impervious portion of the parking, occupies 19,100 square feet of the property. Um, because we're able to develop a more efficient layout, we're only occupying 14,450 square feet. So we're, we're increasing the total number of parking spaces on the site um, and decreasing it um, by approximately uh, 3,900 square feet of coverage. Um, but again, the, that, that parking isn't covered with the building, we're just covered with green roofs. So we're um, kind of maximizing the benefit uh, to the public um, in the way in which we're handling uh, the specific parking structure here. I think everything else I've more or less covered, and I'm happy to dive into more detail as additional questions come up. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Andrew at this time on the board? All right. Um, did you want to say anything? Or? All right. So why don't we then um, open this up for, uh, for public comment? If you want to just pass those down. Thank you. And again, if you want to make public comment, I see on that table back there are cards. Just put your name on there and your address. 
Um, and also, I think, Andrew, do you want to put out some of the samples so we just people can look at them? I know some of them are heavy. All right, and while you're doing that, um, Tony, let me see. They're heavy. Yeah, they're heavy. So don't, don't pick them up with one hand. Yes. Please okay. be careful. Hi, Tony. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have lived in Chappaqua for 25 years and reside on King Street with family members. I am pro-development, but not when the project benefits the developer versus the taxpaying community, or more speci specifically, the residents in the impact zone, which when my family and I are in. As a banker, I have financed developers and large construction projects. So I understand why this proposal is of mammoth size. I get it. The recent, the respective developer and their attorney or architect are not living across the street and seeing a four to five story building that blocks out the sun, nor do they have to deal with the increased traffic, parking, or septic system strains that will be created by this proposal. Ask yourself as board members, if each of you moved your families across the street, would you like to see this massive structure every day? I personally have served as a planning board member in a nearby local town and know what the repercussions can be when one developer is allowed to stretch the zoning parameters beyond the norm. I can assure everyone that a carte blanche approval for the special permit zoning law governed by one um, by one governing body will give the right away for other developers. The next developer with a great architect and land use attorney will exploit the situation and push their project, impacting the character of our hamlet and at the very least creating litigious situations that we the taxpayer will, taxpayers will pay for. The proposed development is unacceptable for many reasons. The scope and size of the 55 foot, give or take, high project is totally at a scale to the existing commercial and retail buildings, even if they're already three stories. Whether the project is LEED certified or is being marketed as a low carbon footprint, the proposed building simply does not fit with the fabric of our hamlet. This proposal does not provide adequate parking for its own tenants thus impacting local residents and business owners given limited street parking. I would be very surprised given what we just heard about one parking spot for service delivery. How the world is about convenience. Uber drivers, UPS, whoever they may be, that alone, that one parking structure is just not enough for that one building. That's just one example. Though development is warranted at North Gurley Avenue, it is up to the developer to conform to the town's building code and framework. They should not be driving the process in our town. Their main purpose is to sell a project that maximizes their ROI, which is return on investment, and not to create a project that is in the best interest of our community. Tonight, I ask this question, why would any town of Newcastle board member agreed to a developer's proposal with so many zoning concessions without the planning board first vetting the, this controversial project. In summary, the town's website includes a tab labeled Community Vision. It states that the community's primary intent is to preserve Newcastle's Yukawa character of low density development and achieve the best outcome for the community. However, this proposed project at this point in time is the extreme opposite. Thank you for everyone's time tonight. Thank you. Okay, next is James Driscoll. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here tonight. I moved to this town about two years ago from the city. One of the main reasons I moved up here was because there was rampant overdevelopment 
in all the five boroughs of the city where they took no input from any of the residents. It was completely driven by developers. <clears throat> and many times the city council there would overrule what the local community boards had voted against. Like the prior speaker, I'm not anti-development, <clears throat> but I've lived through many years in the city of, if we build it, they will come, and they never come. You know, neighborhoods develop on their own. You can't just build a big building <clears throat> and expect that it's suddenly going to be Williamsburg, just because we built a six-story luxury building. Most of the people that want to live in that type of environment <clears throat> Don't want to move to a town like this in my opinion they want to live in the city so i don't see how just because we're going to bring the city here we think these people are suddenly going to move if anybody else noticed all the examples that they were showing are all heavy urban environments you know they need green roofs in manhattan because they don't have green spaces we have all that here you know most people who moved here <clears throat> moved here because of the environment and i think it's preposterous because it's very hard to do anything in this town if you want to do something on your own property so i think it's funny that we're going to allow you know like the prior speaker said somebody to come from the outside and just bulldoze all over the rules and regulations that this town has spent how many years putting in and that everybody who lives here has to do here by, but we're just gonna blanket vote that way for a project. And then what's gonna be the next project after that? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just do wanna let everyone know that uh, we do speak with our planning board and there is a working group also made up of two members of the town board, two members of the planning board, and two members of the architectural review board, or board of architecture review, um, who are looking at this project as well as soliciting public input. Okay, Lynn Lambert. And just a reminder, if you want to speak, please fill out a card and, and hand it over to the table. I love our little downtown. Um, it has a small town feeling and it's perfectly exemplified by what's about to happen on Memorial Day when we have our little parade that musters on our street. Um, that's the small town I love. My husband and I have been here for 29 years and I have to say I've wondered how certain decisions were made in the past in terms of downtown development. Um, some of them were kind of bad decisions, I think, um, and the, some of the visible ones I might bring up on that are our wonderful library, full of heart, but with a terribly out of place design on the outside. It goes with none of its neighbors, neither residential nor commercial. How was that design allowed right next to the beautiful Church of St. Mary's and our stately Bell School? I've heard that local realtors have called that area of downtown with the church and the Bell School, the, the place that sold a thousand houses in Chappaqua, who can't be just knocked out coming to the train station and seeing that. Um, I'm sure we were. <laughs> so. I'm not really sure how that library decision was made, but there it is, and it doesn't and never will fit in. Then there's Town Hall. Were they just trying to save money? At least it's brick, which goes with some of the other buildings in town, but it has no character and charm, which many of the town halls across Westchester County do have. Um, it was a missed opportunity to make something beautiful for our town. That makes me sad. So let's move on to the building where Pizza Station and Citibank are. Wow, charmless, what can I say? And of course, right behind the, that building is our beautiful former train station building, now Bobo's. But when the Pizza Station building was authorized, 
It was still a vintage train station and beautiful. So who is responsible for allowing such an ugly building that doesn't fit? Kudos to our former town board member, Lauren Levin, and all of those who put some lipstick on that building with the planter and the lovely old clock. Thank you. But really? So here we are. We have a piece of prime real estate with that ugly building on it where Rite Aid used to be. I don't know who was responsible for approving that building's design, but it was always an eyesore and it didn't fit. And now we are informed that the owner wants to develop a project larger than the zoning would allow. A four-story building built nearly edge to edge on their property and twice the height of the Susan Lawrence building next to it. The character that I see of this building feels stripped down and modern. So here are my issues. Character. The look of this building doesn't fit with any other building in our town. Question, are we going to continue allowing that as a town? When and if the property, the former Maxine's next door to it is developed, will we have yet another style of building there? And then when maybe the old Lutheran church property is, uh, the church is torn down and developed, yet another? Can't we as a town and with both the planning board and the architectural board, create guidelines for what we'd like to see in new development that fits with the character of our town and move forward with that. I see nothing here that fits with our downtown at all. Using environmentally friendly materials seems both good and smart, but there must be some way that, that those materials can be used to make a more traditional and fitting design for us size please let us keep the building that is to be built here to the size allowed by our current zoning this is not to scale and it doesn't fit in our tiny downtown as chuck napoli has proven with his design we can still have both affordable and market rate apartments and even maybe a diner there but both a building in character with what is so charming about Chappaqua and with enough parking so that both local shoppers and restaurant diners can easily find parking and the neighbors are North Greeley, Maple and Bischoff not have the nightmare of people circling their block to find street parking because what has been provided is inadequate. Lastly, our ambulance corps, their vehicles, their depot is right there and they shouldn't have to contend with traffic congestion to get out their calls. Board members and fellow residents, what is built in this spot will live with us for generations to come. Let's make sure our downtown has both a right size, pleasing, and harmonious vibe. Don't allow this oversized modern building where it doesn't belong. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Karen Anton. I spoke here last time and I've lived here for 37 years, which is rather scary. So I've seen a lot. Um, I had a lot of questions when I came in, some of which have been answered to some extent by the presentation, which was very helpful. But I do have certain concerns. And the first one really is still about the parking. Because as was acknowledged in the last meeting, it is not, no one can restrict, least of all the, the developer, how many cars inhabitants can have. So unfortunately, it's illusory to think that just because there's one space allotted for each apartment, that that's going to stay at one space, one car for each inhabitant or whatever, each apartment dweller. So that to me is still a very major concern because in fact, I had to park over the library tonight because there was no space here. So we all know parking is certainly an issue. Beyond that, um, in terms of the green roof, and now we see it may be a green roof, solar roof, I think we should be able to see what that would look like, because it doesn't look like what's been presented. It wouldn't be all green. So it would be helpful, I would think, to see how that would work. Um, that would be my second question. My third is 
Has anyone thought about geothermal, which is certainly environmentally friendly? It may be very costly, I really don't know. But that is certainly, I would think, something maybe that could be considered. Um, a lot of these environments, a lot of the examples are from the city, a city, British Columbia, New York City. I, I would love to see examples of this done in a town like ours. Um, I would also, sorry, one thing that I, I know a lot was said about the maintenance and hopefully having a low maintenance green roof or how if you incorporate solar panels that may help the green roof, but, and that, that's very admirable, but what happens if it fails? Is a bond posted? How is that redressed? This is not a co-op or condominium that's proposed where if something like that happens, unfortunately, the owners have to pay an assessment. So what happens with that? How long could something like that be guaranteed? Um, I think that's a major issue because unfortunately, um, years ago I was involved with wind turbines and it started out great. But as we've seen, there are many wind turbines that now are in disarray, they're broken, blades falling off. There's no one there to take care of it. The investors have all gone. So we wouldn't want that, I think, to happen here. Not that I'm saying that would, but it's a thought. I agree with everything that's been said about the character of our town. I do not think that this is in keeping at all with where we would hope to go or where people who live here, how they pretty much see their town. I'm only speaking for myself, but it seems there are a lot of people that may feel that way. So it would be nice to see an alternative design that incorporates these building materials, but maybe in a different design. and. I think that going back again to the solar integrated green roofs, it was mentioned they may be in matte black. Well, what is that going to look like if you're approaching the town where you see things? It's not New York City. No one other than somebody in a helicopter is going to see the roofs on the top of the Chapman Center or all the other places. So that's something we really need to see what to do about that. I think those are all my questions. I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank Thanks, Sarah. I want to follow up on a question that she just asked. What, what is the possibility of geothermal? Is that with the water level and is that we, something that can be done? And we're still under a gas moratorium, so. Right. So, so, so as part of the, the energy zero legislation, uh, the provision for um, all electric utilities uh, in the building is now superseded by New York State law, which effectively does that um, regardless. Uh, so I, in the response, uh, I listed four different kind of on-site um, energy uh, generation or modification technologies that could be utilized. So, so solar PV is one, uh, solar hot water is another, um, uh, micro turbines, wind energy is another that can be used, but in this case is, is unlikely for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then the last one is geothermal. And so geothermal uh, doesn't generate electricity unless you're in Iceland and have an you know, actual vent of magma to, uh, to produce steam. But what it does do is it tempers uh, a liquid that's, that's pumped through uh, either a well or cool loops. Uh, and so it's used a lot using shallow earth temperature, so 55 degrees, to temper uh, a coolant, which is then transferred into the building. Um, and so it's basically reducing the need to add electricity to either cool or heat. So that is something that, that absolutely can be investigated. It depends on the geotechnical specifics of the site. Um, of the two options, the, um, kind of the shallow coils typically require a quite large site, um, which this doesn't have for a variety of reasons. Um, so the other alternative is to use a deeper pile, and that is something that we've utilized in uh, projects in Connecticut and New York before. Um, so it's, it's certainly feasible. Generally, um, geotechnical data would tell you whether it's actually possible on the site, though. Thank you. Okay, next we have Chuck Napoli. And that's the last of my cards, so if anyone else wants to speak, please fill out a card. Uh, <clears throat> you ask this guy what time it is, and he tells you how to make a watch. 
But um, I enjoy the details. A very expensive watch. Very, and I enjoy the details. And, and all of the things that he talks about can be done in any building. As a matter of fact, my neighbor just did geothermal in his little house. And I think the techniques and the, and the quality of the, the materials and, and the systems that are out there are available to all of us. Um, and I compliment them for being at the forefront. Um, and it's a lesson. We should learn a lesson because we should be asking everybody in this town to consider the same techniques, the same, the same quality and the same format of, uh, of our construction. Um, um, I, but I, I do want to go back, 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 back to the form-based code because this is a project that was left over from the form-based code. This very site, this very corner, this very eight-tenths of an acre that we're developing to its maximum right now. Um, if you want to call it maximum, it's at 56 units per acre. Uh, subtract, uh, multiply by 0.8, we're down to 45. Um, but that's urban density, not small, intimate, welcoming density for our town that our conference plan has set up for us already. So we're not following the needs and wants of the conference of plan. And, and of course, um, the seeds of, of grandeur that are all over this project, on the roof or in the intensive or not intensive, um, are sold with, with hands of greed and uh, looking for a dollar based on the, the housing market. It's a, it's a ROI, as Mr. Palmisi says, um, it's a play on using housing as a business. And um, that's not exactly welcoming and friendly. Um, and, and now the, the big point is that they're seeking relief from a self-imposed need. I mean, if you were a zoning board, you would say, wait a second, uh, we didn't ask you to do that, and why are you doing that? Take out that swimming pool, because you didn't follow the rules, or, or reduce the height of that building. You've seen it over, you've seen it over and over again. We've, we've taken buildings down, we've taken swimming pools out, because they were presented with hands, with dirty hands, and, and not being within the code. Um, I say that Flash and Splash legislated in haste. Uh, by the way, this is not hasty, and I thank you for the long and comprehensive record building so that uh, you could make a, a, an informed decision there. Um, but the way, if this gets approved, will now pave, as Mr. Balnese said, um, more adversarial tastes. Uh, people will come in with different needs, different wants, different tastes. The uh, problem is we don't know what we want as a town. So when I, when I, when I, when I think about the, the plantings and the seeds of grandeur, and so, I, I think of all of the succulents that are up on that roof. And, and if you don't mind me playing around with those words, I mean, I mean um, number one, they sucked up all the parking uh, just for themselves. Um, They've sucked up all the open space um, that we are traditionally used to or building some space, which would be a garage, a driveway to a garage, or it's a building a space, a building a space that's all over town. And that's sort of part of the character. And they sucked up the intimacy of North Greeley Avenue. Um, the character, as Mrs. Ms. Lambert says, is offensive. And if you, if you look at any zoning law, um, it's offensive to the visual sensibilities of the average person. Or these are average people, yeah, we're not trained. Um, but they also sucked up the small in small town, and that bothers me an awful lot, because uh, we all wanted that feel, that vibe. And they have saved the planet but um, killed the Hamlet, in my mind. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Miranda Christ. Hi, 
Hi, folks. I just wanted to say a word in favor of the proposal for 50 North Greeley. I go to college, uh, Wellesley College in Massachusetts, and we have an excellent blend at our school between really old, traditional buildings and new, modern, vibrant architecture that takes into account um, environmental concerns and tries to solve those problems while also creating that blended, beautiful campus feel. And it works. I know it can work, just coming from my experiences there. And I think that this project that they're bringing forward, which I so appreciate how beautiful it is, how forward thinking it is, and how interesting it is. And I think that this will work in our Hamlet because, as people have said, it is a bit of a mishmash of different things. I don't think we necessarily have anything cohesive to go on to create something that's more quote unquote cohesive. And I think that this is a great project that they're bringing forward. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from anyone here in person? Okay, can you please just fill out a card so we have the information and you can just come on up and give it to me. <laughs> if, you, if you already spoke, just fill out. I'm, we're going to wait for everyone to speak okay. once and then see online and then we can take you again. Thank you. Okay, William Rosenfeld. Hi, um, um, I'm Dr. William Rosenfeld. I've lived here since 1983. That makes it 40 years. Um, I came here uh, because I couldn't stand the city of White Plains. I went to White Plains because I couldn't stand the city of New York. Uh, I've been very happy here. Uh, I think everybody's presentations have been really good. Um, it's nice to know about sustainability, uh, aesthetics, all these things. But it seems to me that that is <sighs> poorly used time in this discussion. The issue is you have 56 apartments or such, more or less. One, one parking spot for each. And it's hard to find a parking spot in the in a lot of course from Susan Lawrence right now. So are we to think that there's one person in each apartment, that each one has a car? It sounds to me like the main thing here is, aside from all the other issues, where are all these cars come, going to go? There's not enough parking. It sounds to me like our current um, rules and regs would account for that. But otherwise, uh, unless I'm missing something, I don't get it. There, there's going to be 100 cars. That's 50 more than what we're anticipating. Where do they go? Are we going to give them the parking lot for the post office? Or what? I, uh, th that that seems to me to be the issue. It's going to change. This building is going to flow all over into the downtown area, where there already is, to some degree, at different times of the day and of days of the week, uh, difficulty parking. It's not the biggest deal. I walk all the time. Many people don't. Many people need to park where they want to shop or. Whatever. So I, I, I think all the other stuff is fluff. The issue is how is this going to impact the actual way that life goes on in the downtown area? And I can't, as I say, I, 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 I'm open to hearing where all these extra cars are going to go. But I've lived in cities, I've lived in towns. One, one car per unit, that, that doesn't make any sense in the modern world that I can understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Maggie Christ. Hi. Good evening. I would just want to say that I think the parking thing is specious. I, my family. Maggie Christ. I called her out. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. My family, um, it's husband, child, me. There's only three of us. 
And for most of the time that we've lived here, we have had one car. We live walking distance to the train station, which means we are walking distance to Chase Bank, to the library, to downtown. You don't need to have two cars to live in this town. It's just a fact, right? And if you are living someplace where you're close to the train station, you really don't need a second car. So it's a specious argument to say that everybody in this building is going to need two cars. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else uh, here who has not yet spoken who would like to speak? Can you just give me your name? Yes, my name is Jim Russell from a neighboring town of Mount Pleasant. And uh, I follow the whole form based zoning debates, and we had the same situation in Mount Pleasant. We had a large apartment building that's gone up on Commerce Street, but not half as large as this project. And many of you must be familiar with the large, or I should say, monstrous building next to the Pleasantville Post Office, which is probably on a scale with this building, and it's really totally out, totally out of the character. This philosophy of this type of building was, really comes out of the new urbanism. You can see in that video, there's hardly any setbacks. It's very narrow, it's like streets in a city. And uh, it would be a precedent that would affect my town as well as this town and neighboring towns. So I think it's very important to stand firm against this type of development. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone online who would like to speak? Okay, so uh, Helen, do you want to uh, unmute yourself, please? All right, we're going to move to Robert Lewis. Rob, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Robert Lewis. Uh, I've been a resident in Newcastle for about 27 years. I served on the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee. Uh, I'd like to, uh, perhaps I should say that uh, when I was uh, working on the Comprehensive Plan, we really did not address any uh, physical issues uh, physical planning issues. We we focused as much as I would have preferred to go into some of the physical problems. Uh, we did not address those issues, and and one of the issues that I was concerned about was how how the hamlet, the Chappaqua Hamlet, would develop. Uh, we were very concerned. I was very concerned. How how could we see? How could we encourage the development of the hamlet, the commercial development, particularly in light of the uh, retail project at Ch Chappaqua Crossing? I know that uh, you know it's been probably. I think that that Chappaqua Crossing was an issue was 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 being developed as long ago as 2005. So it took as much as uh, 10 years in discussions, maybe more than that, before uh, things proceeded there. Certainly the comprehensive plan was being discussed at that time. but but let's let's just focus on North Greeley. North Greeley is, quite congested. When I drive on North Greeley today, I have to drive quite slowly. I'm concerned that people who are parked may be opening their doors, so I have to drive very slowly. I'm Parking is an issue in town, and I've heard people saying that there's not enough parking as is, in town, I'm, so whether the apartments have been provided enough parking is certainly a question, but 
and whether the small amount of retail that's being provided in the project that's being proposed is whether that needs more parking and whether they're the shared um, the shared car arrangement it makes any sense I, I don't I don't I don't know enough about it whether whether the people there whether that really makes sense to me but but the this what what concerns me the most is that North Greeley is out of it it just doesn't feel right it just the street life there it it seems out of character with our with our hamlet and it it i have the sense that it doesn't fit in and that it it will be a sort of a dead end it will be it just it it doesn't seem like the right way to solve the problem of affordable housing of, of this imperative that the governor and the country as a whole needs to solve. We need to develop housing density in our suburbs. How do we do that? This project is perhaps an attempt to address that problem, but maybe we shouldn't be looking to solve that problem with just this project maybe maybe the problem is is, is something that we should be addressing in another way and and so if the, if the application at hand is a project for north greeley then maybe this is not the solution it, it just seems too dense to me street life seems to be wrong the project is too tall i have the sense as an architect that i will be on a street that is overpowered that the that the height of the building is too overpowering and that i am going to feel that uh i am walking by a building that is just too it, it, I don't have enough room. I don't have enough over, open space. I don't have enough uh, elbow room. I, I want something more uh, at the at the streetscape. That's that's where that's where I am most concerned. Thank you. Thanks, right. Thanks Bob. Uh, Don, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, everyone. I'm calling in Don Feinberg. We own the property and uh, we've owned it for more than 50 years. So at least tonight, I think I have seniority. Um, but I have to speak tonight because I wanna give a little background. When I hear about ROI, when I hear words tossed around like greed, when I hear developer used as a word as though it's a terrorist or a dirty word, I have to tell you that I get very upset. And the reason I get very upset is because I brought all these people that are there tonight into this project. I don't have enough experience to develop this on my own, but I brought Jeff in because he has a great deal of experience. I also had a passion to do something for this property that is far better than what's there now. And I think everybody who thinks about this project has to know something. The alternative is not between this project and some other project. It's between this project and what's there now, which we will then just rent as is, with its present beauty spot and the 20,000 square feet of asphalt that you apparently think makes a contribution to the Hamlet. I don't think it makes a contribution to the Hamlet. I don't think it's a highest best use. I think it's a very partial use and I think it's an imperfect use. And lastly, while I'm in my sort of rant phase, I hope to get to the more constructive phase afterward. I wanna tell you that the amount of expertise and hours that have been poured into this project is immense. What Andrew and Bray Organsky has done is extraordinary. And we cannot build a building of the type that we hope to build with the kind of green, both 
On the capital side, meaning the amount of uh, carbon that is not used during the building product process and the amount of carbon that would be used to operate it, we can't do it at two stories, which is about the present zoning, if I understand correctly, and we can't even do it at three stories. But here's the kicker for that fact. We have been talking about building on this piece of property at the invitation, at the invitation of Chappaqua for five years. I was contacted over five, five years ago asking if I would develop this property. And I said I would, and I said I wanted to. But I also said I only wanted to do something that was significant. Not something that would make me rich, Chuck Napoli, or the gentleman banker who spoke, but something that would contribute to the town architecturally, and yes, would challenge the town to move in a new direction, but a direction I think we all have to move in if we're gonna live on this planet for an, another 30 years. I don't wanna to be too topical, but if you read the paper, we're gonna go above 1.5C in the next seven years. So we either have to do something about that and take it seriously, or we can continue to drive downtown if we don't live downtown and basically just get there in five years, get break 1.5C in three years. The young lady from Wellesley, I can't thank her enough for speaking in favor of this project because it's her future. It's not our future. I'm 67 years old. I don't know how old the gentlemen were talking, but I think a lot of them were about my age. But we have to stop looking at our navels and start looking forward and start grasping the future. And guess what? It's not going to be a car-based future if we're going to have a future. And when you ask for a transit-oriented development, you're talking about transit. And it has to be near a train station, which this project is. It's about, I think, 1,100 feet. You know, it's 400 strides from the, from the rail station. And when you talk about immense, it's 45 units. I believe there are 17,000 people live in Newcastle. This is 45 units. We're uh, based on the configuration of those units, we're talking about maybe 100 people. Have some sense and proportion. Now, if you don't like the project, that's perfectly fine with me. But I do object, and I think you can hear it in my voice, to the idea that the intent was anything other than to be as constructive, productive, and future-oriented as we could possibly be. And I found great people to help me. And I have, as you know, not spoken very often because I have let them do it because it is their talent. It's not mine. All I have is a piece of property and a dream. And if we, don't, if we can't have the dream come true, we can live as we have for 50 years renting a 9,000 square foot Quonset hut and having 50 spaces of parking, which by the way, the town used only because Rite Aid didn't wanna piss off the people in town and they would let them park there even if they weren't shopping there. But that was the decision of the manager, not what, that wasn't zoning or anything else. So I'm sorry if I sound uh, harsh or I'm sorry if I sound very upset, but on the level of the emotional concept of what brought us to this pass where we are now. By the way, having invested $200,000 and counting in hopes that we would be able to demonstrate our bona fides, I hope that you all know that we are extremely, extremely dedicated to doing something good. I have a track record. I built a brewery called Brewery Omegang. You can all look it up in, in, um, on Google. I think you can tell if you do take the time that I have a decent aesthetic. I also built a net zero house, 100% net zero in operation in British Columbia. By the way, and lastly, the pictures you were shown were to show you in situ examples, not for size, but for the, for, but for the items being demonstrated. It wasn't that we want to have a building. It's not a question of whether it's in a city, if you see them or if you have extensive plantings, it's just to show you that if you can do it on a big building, you can do it on a smaller building. That's the purpose of those demonstrations. Anyway, I, I can't close Lisa with anything else other than the fact that I think you know very well and some people on the, on the board know very well that we've been at this for a long time. We have only the best of intentions. We can certainly understand if this is not the direction you wanna go in, but we do need a direction, number one, and we want you to know that the direction we're trying to ask you to go in 
is one that's from our heart. So thank you. All right, thank you, Don. Thank you. Um, Helen Richards, we're gonna try you one more time. You can unmute. It's the little button on the bottom. <laughs> can you okay, hear me? No. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good, okay. Well, I just want to say, I don't know what you're thinking. The buildings are ugly. The pictures are really unattractive. We don't need houses that look like warehouses. Chappaqua is a hamlet. It's not a town, it's not a village. Uh, Chuck Napoli has some plans that are charming. Charm would be fine. However, this doesn't look fine, sound fine, sound charming. If you look at Bedford, you look at Ormonk, they would not allow uh, something that looked like, like warehouses. We're talking, I think, about appearances, and we certainly could use the parking downtown. And I really and truly think that something better could be built there. And I don't understand why we need builders from Minneapolis when I know there are buildings, builders in New York who know how to build just as well as out west. So I think you should take another hard, long hard look at the plans and say, okay, we're willing to do this, but it has to be charming. It has to fit into the town. And that's all you have to do. I don't think it's that hard. Uh, it does just because it's gonna be helpful and utilitarian doesn't mean it can't be attractive. It does not need to be ugly. And that's all I can say. <laughs> I've lived here for 50 years. My husband's family grew up here. So I'm pretty much a native and that's my thoughts. So let's hope we can move along and do something charming and attractive. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Helen. Thank you. All right, Cynthia Seamus. You can unmute yourself, Cynthia. Hi, can everybody hear me? We can. Good evening. Um, so multiple people tonight have been talking about the potential issues with whatever we want to call this set of zoning variances, spot zoning or whatever we want to call that, call it. And multiple people have been talking a lot about the aesthetics of the downtown and um, kind of painting this picture as if it's a Norman Rockwell scene of 19th century elegance, but um, it's not. The truth is that our downtown is currently a hodgepodge of low slung mid-century buildings, many of which are not in great condition and most of which are one to two stories. Um, at some point, eventually, maybe it's after I die, but probably not, at some point, these properties are going to get developed. And I just wanna point out the crashing irony of the fact that all of these comments that are complaining about individualized zoning and complaining about a hodgepodge looking downtown and how things are not stylistically similar to some ideal that they have in their mind are basically advocating for the idea of a standardized zoning overlay in downtown Chappaqua. So I just wanted to kind of point out how far we've come in a year and exactly how far we have not come in a year. And uh, on a final note, I would really on behalf of, of some of this town, I would personally like to apologize to Mr. Feinberg um, for personal attacks on him. And uh, I think it's uh, unexcusable. And I don't think that that should be allowed to stand. Um, this man has had made a significant investment into our town. 
And like he said, his family has owned property here for as long as I've been alive. And I don't think that that's appropriate to characterize him as some quote, greedy developer or some outsider. Um, heard all sorts of things tonight, most of which are not appropriate when referring to him. So I would like to extend an apology to him um, from someone who's only lived here a little shy of 20 years. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. All right, Sugar Fat. Hi. Hi. Okay, hi, just want to make sure. It's Shakufe. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shakufe. Um, I live in Chappaqua. I have um, two kids. One is going to turn five next month and one is one and a half. Um, I'm going to turn 35 this summer, and that's relevant because um, what I, I wanted to just start by saying, or maybe reminding us, because it seems like it's almost left the conversation, that there's an actual housing crisis in this state. And um, the crisis, like there is such a deep shortage of housing that we almost got mandated by the governor to develop, right? Like there's an actual, <laughs> we're, we're there. Um, and so it, we're almost at a point where we evaded, you know, this once that, that we had no choice. But we're, we're going to not be able to do that because there is an actual crisis. My generation, um, like my generation is struggling to find homes. And I don't even understand, honestly, like knowing the way that we're making this homework, like how my, my children will be able to find homes. Um, I think that we have a choice right now and it's, our, it's really an opportunity to show up as a town for the, the governor for the state of New York, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to show up as a town that can respond to community needs without being mandated to. Like this is the chance that we have, this is an example of that. And what changes towns for the worst is not development. I think of when people like this, it sounds like that's what keeps getting repeated. What changes towns for the worst is not development. Honestly, it's not developing soon enough. And I, I know this because I come from a state where this happened. I watched it happen at my doorstep. I grew up in the Bay Area, California. And when I was, you know, a teenager, I, I, I grew up there. I went to school at UC Berkeley. Like I've stayed there just before I came, basically a year before I moved here. And um, everyone constantly, when like we were exactly in this position, everyone would come and there was like, you know, suggestions, thoughtful suggestions for development. Everyone came and said so much of what's being said here. They'd say, but my view, but my skyline view, but my sunset view. And then they'd say like, what are we gonna do when there's more people? And what are we gonna do when there's, you know, our, what? how are we going to spread the resources? How are we going to, it was always that over and over again until there was delay and delay and delay and delay. And then the state got to a level where it was actually a full, like it was past emergency. And at that point, there were there were no thought put into buildings. It was just build, 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 and they're still trying to catch up. And when things go up that quickly, then you guys all who keep saying this is ugly, then you will see what happens. Because when you were responding to that level of emergency, which we are already just pre to, like we are just before that, it is not pretty. It's actually not pretty. <laughs> And so this isn't like this development isn't perfect, but it's thoughtfully made. It's not rash. It's not careless. You can say a lot of things about it, but you can't say those things. And the truth is that no housing is going to feel perfect. It's not going to feel perfect for a lot of people because because people are afraid and it's not about the green roof. And honestly, it's not about the geothermal and the parking. A lot of it is just fear of change. And I wish we could say that because then we could come together as a community and I would be right there with you because I'm not, I'm not there when you're saying is the solar panel going to kill the little flower on the top of the rooftop, but I can be there with you if you're saying I'm afraid of change and I can comfort you and we can comfort one another. And I'd say to you like, yes, I understand that this can be scary. And I understand that we don't know what's gonna happen. But I could also say to you that there is more to this town than it's unoccupied lots of land. Like that's not what, that's not what we need to protect. What makes this town enjoyable 
is so much more than that. It's the generosity and the passion and the care and all of that, that's not going anywhere. I feel like we have to have faith that we are enough to welcome change because change is going to happen. And it's the only way for a community or a town to remain healthy. So what, what will happen when there's more people and more desire for resources? We come together and we learn how to share and we learn to celebrate our difference. Because the reality is either change is going to happen slowly the way it is now with just one thoughtful, however large, very thoughtful building in an unoccupied lot, or it's gonna happen so fast and by demand that at that point, it's gonna cost a lot more than just a few extra minutes to find a parking spot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else online who wants to speak? No other hand raised. Okay, is there anyone else here who did not yet speak who would like to speak? Maggie. Hi. Um, this project is, is not going to bring, um, to materially diversify housing for people in the middle to lower income ranges, putting aside the legally required affordable housing. We're making a lot of concessions to bring more luxury housing options to this community. You go down the Washington Avenue into Pleasantville, there are 68 townhomes built a few years ago, which initially sold, I think, for five to $700,000. I don't know what they're selling for now. You have 91 townhomes coming at Chapel Hill Crossing. I think the starting price is 1.2 million. You have two new construction apartment buildings in Pleasantville. You have two bedrooms there renting, two bedrooms that are a little over a thousand square feet at the one in the sawmill renting for about $4,360. You have two bedrooms at 39 Washington Avenue or the Washington Avenue loss that are about 948 square feet rent, rent, renting in the range of $5,000. These are luxury apartments. These apartments, are the two bedrooms are gonna be renting in the five to $6,000 range if you take smaller apartments going for that price nearby. We would, I understand it's private property, but this idea that the law is doubling the current square footage in the Hamlet from 1,000 square feet maximum to 2,000. These are large apartments. They are not going to be for the middle to lower income ranges, and it's a tremendous lost opportunity. One reason to keep the square footage at a thousand square feet is it makes the, the way it's done, it makes the rent more affordable. Do we really want to make all these concessions to bring more housing options? During the foreign based code, I heard from many people in the, saying, in the middle income ranges saying, what about us? We have no choices. We have to leave the area. We have to sell our homes when our kids are out because we can't afford to stay here. I talked to somebody at the farmer's market who lived here and is now in Sleepy Hollow who said the same thing. They could not find middle rental rates in order to stay here after they sold their house. So is this really where we want to go? I mean, the idea that this is going to be diversifying the housing stock, other than adding some legally defined affordable housing, it is not. It's more high-end housing. And is that what we want to make all these concessions for? I hope not. I mean, there are other ways to do this, but making concessions to allow 2,000 square foot or 1,450 square foot to bedrooms seems really backward after all the talk about housing needs of the middle income uh, families and, and couples and individuals. It just doesn't seem right to me. Um, my in-laws sold a house in Yonkers many years ago, and they moved to an apartment building in Mount Kisco, and I've said this before, they were assigned, uh, the building had one parking space for apartment. Now, when they got there, they, they uh, you know, they downsized, and it was, a, it was about 1,200 square feet, which was good for them. It wasn't rental, um, but it was a, it was a condo. Um, you know, they brought so much to the community there. They participated in a program. Um, called My Second Home, which was an intergenerational community, and it was children and um, older people, and they would work together and teach crafts, and they would it was uh, share experiences, and it was a wonderful program. And they they got so much from being part of that program in Mount Kisco. These are the people that I think would add to our community in ways that we can't even quantify. And, you know, they aren't heavy drivers usually as they get older, but, you know, I'll point out my in-laws still had two cars, even though they were assigned one parking space for most apartments, they had two spaces. And 
we visit them, there was constant pressure about where visitors could park. And we had to park down, and they were they were just by Citibank and Mount Kisco up the hill, so they were walking distance to the train station, and there's a lot more to walk to in Mount Kisco than there is here, but it was constant struggle for parking in that place. So I'm just speaking out for the people in the middle income range, because those are the people that I think are missing in a big part in our community who want to stay here. Um, and I hope that we can, not make concessions for more luxury housing. That to me would be a pointless and a real negative for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else here who'd like to speak? Yeah, I do. I, I was a, a Come on back. It's a quickie. And then Karen, you're next. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to tell Mr. Feinberg that I've been here for 54 years and I, um, I've been paying taxes and living here for 54 years, working in my own hometown as an architect, and I think I qualify as an expert witness on anything that happens in this hamlet, and if I were called by the judge uh, to give my opinion, uh, I think you know where that would go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen. practiced matrimonial law for quite some time. I do feel like I'm in a courtroom trying to <clears throat> keep people apart. I think tempers, you know, people get heated about how they feel. And obviously Mr. Feinberg feels a certain way right now and some people feel other ways. And I don't think, I just want to say, I think at the end of the day, no one really is, everyone's trying to come to a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very obvious that there's a lot of talent here in development of what's happened so far. So I guess I would ask, is it possible to just try to come up with a smaller package, something smaller, something lower? So I think that's what people are really talking about. And quite frankly, if it's lower, you have more sunlight. If it's lower, it's less of an impact on the town or on the land surface. So. It would be wonderful to see if there's an alternative that could be maybe three stories, maybe not have the re retail or have less retail or whatever. But that's, you know, basically, I think that people do want to work together. I think we do want to see something nicer than a parking lot and a building that, you know, at this point needs some kind of rejuvenation. And I'm sure that if we all keep our heads in, we keep cool, we could hopefully find a solution. I, I have faith in this town. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Okay, so um, what are our, we're, what are our next steps? I know that, Sabrina, do you want to talk to this? I know there's um, information we need about parking and traffic and a few things, um, because we have to look at Secret as well. So the, the next step is really for the town to complete the environmental review. Is that on? Yes, this is on. So the next step is uh, to put together an environmental analysis based on all the information that has been submitted. Um, we have one consultant on board, our transportation consultant, who will review the transportation and parking information submitted, submitted by the applicant. Um, this week I've had a conversation with them and they have the information that the applicant has submitted to date and I believe they reached out to the applicant's consultant to talk with them about additional work that may be needed. Um, I am anticipating a letter from our consultant this week to give us some guidance as to what that next step regarding traffic and parking should be. So I can't answer to, the, to what is required or how long that will take at this point. Um, the other area is doing a, um, is verifying the visual and aesthetic information that we have received from the applicant and reaching out to consultants regarding that as well, which we're in the process of doing. Setting that aside, um, we do need to prepare an analysis in accordance with Seeker regarding the 15 categories that Seeker asks us to look at in regards to this development to determine whether or not there is an impact. Um, and that is something that between myself and legal we will do 
um, and have been starting prior to tonight's meeting um, to try and get you a draft of that so you can review it and then make changes and make your own assessment based on professional input. Okay. And I would also like to have an, um, hopefully the first week of June, a meeting with our um, working group, which again is two people from the town board, two from planning board, and two from our board of architectural review, uh, to go over some of the issues discussed and um, and work through those and, and come to next steps as well. So I would propose that we adjourn this public hearing until June 13th, um, at which point we will have, have had time to um, the working group to meet. Um, and then I'm not sure where we'll be with additional information from uh, the applicant and your consultants, but we can work through that. Um, I know you'll try to get that to us as soon as possible. So we were talking about the 13th um, for an initial one, and then we may have another one uh, following that as well, depending on when we get um, information. So can I have a motion to adjourn the public hearing to uh, Tuesday, June 13th at 7 p.m. or as soon as uh, it reaches the agenda of the town board that night? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. As a question about the working group? That's a public body, correct? The working group? It's a public meeting, yes. So it, will it have a published agenda and will the time of the... It will, it will be noticed. It will be noticed. Yes. yes. Okay. It's not a public body i mean it's two it's not I thought the resolution said no, it was actually a it might body. be it's two two people from each of those boards and it will be noticed and open to the public i'm just meeting. i'm recalling the resolution called it yeah. a public body under new york law right and that's where we're treating it right and it will be live streamed so you can watch it okay so, but and, and in person you're welcome okay. to come either right. way thank you very much okay we'll we'll definitely notice that when it is um all right so we're going to move to the next. You're more than welcome to stay, everyone. But all that is left really are our resolutions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. So before we get to our resolutions, uh, the consent agenda, I just want to confirm that there is nothing that anyone wanted to um, remove from that. OK, being none, Holly, do you want to start? One question, just you've got a couple of things on the consent agenda. The uh, uh, suburban carding annual increase point and the uh, authorizing uh, the local law regarding the electronic hybrid. Right. Maybe more info would be helpful. We talked about those at the meeting last week in the work session. I was here, yes. But what I'm saying is just because it, it affects everybody in town. Sure. And no, would no, you like to actually it's not me. It doesn't the suburban so the suburban carding is only for uh, commercial buildings and the school building uh, contract that we okay, have. So that's not it does not okay. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> I move to adopt the consent agenda consisting of the items listed in the agenda. Is that okay? Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I move to approve the payment of claims in the amount of $375,245.13 listed on the summary pre check writing report and detail voucher detail report, both dated May 23rd, 2023. Checks will be issued and mailed to each payment listed on Wednesday, May 24th, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. I move to authorize the hiring of the following individuals as listed in the agenda to the position of recreation attendant within the Recreation and Parks Department to serve as camp staff for the 2023 season at the corresponding hourly rates ranging from $11 to $40.50 per hour, effective June 24, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to authorize the hiring of Lydia 
Young and Rihanna Data to the position of recreation attendant with the Recreation and Parks Department to serve as Art Center assistants at the hourly rate of $15 per hour, effective June 19th, 2023. Would you like to second? Oh, I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to authorize the pay increase for Joshua Munoz, who serves as a seasonal laborer within the Recreation and Parks Department to $17 per hour, effective May 24th, 2023. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to accept the resignation of Tyler Perone from the position of Water Maintenance Worker Grade 2 within the Department of Public Works Water Unit, effective May 22nd, 2023. The town would like to thank Tyler for his service. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to authorize the posting and hiring for the position of laborer within the Department of Public Works Water Unit at the annual salary ranging from $50,119.29 through $68,829.07. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to accept the resignation of Kellen Cantrell from the position of assistant planner within the Development Department, effective May 29th, 2023. The town would like to thank Kellen for his service. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to accept the resignation of Ingrid Schloss, Suzanne Chazen, Margaret Ferguson, Vincent Conyers, and Ronnie Diamondstein from the Beautification Advisory Board, effective May 1, 2023. The town would like to thank them for their service. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'd like to say something about that very brief. I just want to say that it, as former liaison to this committee, it's a resignation of a lot of people from the committee. And I, I just want to um, ask all of us to just be mindful of the way that we, we talk to each other and also to always assume good intentions. Um, I believe that there were a lot of miscommunications and um, I, I just think that we need to take a step back and think about how we communicate with each other. And um, again, always assume good intentions and always try to um, collaborate and talk to each other when there are misunderstandings. Thank you. If there were issues you were aware of, if you could let the board know those issues, we would appreciate that. Um, not right now, but in executive um, session, if there are issues you're aware yeah. of, we would appreciate knowing those. Yeah, I, I just think it was mainly misunderstandings, but I, I just think something ought to be said because we obviously have five people from the committee resigning. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, I move to authorize the adoption of the Recreation Parks Master Plan as amended. Second, all in favor, aye. 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 I move to adopt the local law amending town code 12332 regarding electronic hybrid car charging. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to award bids to the lowest responsible bidders on a DPW 2023-03 water treatment chemicals bid for one year period from the time of the award with the possibility of a one year extension. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, I will read the, the reasonable title. proclamation. Yeah. Um, I move to adopt the following resolution. Whereas the town of Newcastle, New York, upholds the value and dignity of each person and champions the rights, freedoms, and equality of all individuals and families. And whereas all are welcome in the town of Newcastle to live, work, play, and deserve to feel a sense of belonging, inclusion, and equality, and a place to call home where they are safe, happy, and supported by friends and neighbors. Whereas the town denounces prejudice and unfair discrimination based on age, gender identity, gender expression, race, color, ethnicity, religion, marital status, national origin, sexual orientation, ability, socioeconomic status, or physical attributes as an affront to our fundamental principles. And whereas Pride Month commences this commemorates, pardon me, the Stonewall Uprising in New York City, which took place in June of 1969, when lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, plus, and allied friends took a stand for human rights and dignity and fought against police harassment and discriminatory laws that have since been declared unconstitutional. And whereas LGBTQ plus people have fought for equal treatment, dignity, and respect and have achieved significant milestones, ensuring that future generations of LGBTQ plus people will enjoy a more equal and just society. And whereas LGBTQ plus people still face disparities in employment, healthcare, education, housing, 
and many other areas central to the pursuit of happiness in the United States. And whereas the town of Newcastle recognizes the valuable cultural, civic, and economic contributions of the LGBTQ plus community, which strengthens our social welfare, and whereas it is imperative that young people in our community, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, feel valued, safe, empowered, and supported by their peers and community leaders, and whereas, despite being marginalized, LGBTQ plus people continue to celebrate authenticity, acceptance, and whereas the town of Newcastle reaffirms its commitment to standing in solidarity with LGBTQ plus people and families in their own ongoing struggle against discrimination and injustice. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of this town declare the month of June 2023 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in the town of Newcastle and urges residents to recognize the contributions made by members of the LGBTQ plus community and to actively promote principles of equality, liberty, and justice. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 I move to adopt the following resolution declaring the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the town of Newcastle, to honor and remember all victims and survivors of gun violence, and to declare that we as a country must do more to reduce gun violence. Whereas every day more than 110 Americans are killed by gun violence, alongside more than 230 who are shot and wounded, and on average there are more than 13,000 gun homicides every year. And whereas, Americans are 25 times more likely to die by gun homicide than people in other developed countries. And whereas, cities and towns across the nation, including the town of Newcastle, New York, are working to end the senseless violence. And whereas, protecting public safety in the communities we serve is the town board's highest responsibility. And whereas, support for the Second Amendment, amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. And whereas gun violence prevention is more important than ever as the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated gun violence after years of increased gun sales, increased calls to suicide and domestic violence hotlines, and an increase in city gun violence. And whereas in January 2013, Adia Pendleton was tragically shot and killed at the age of 15 on a playground in Chicago. And whereas the first National Gun Violence Awareness Day was declared on June 2nd, 2018, on what would have been Hadia's 18th birthday. And whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange, they chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods, and orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas on June 2nd, 2023, to recognize what would have been Hadia's 26th birthday, she was born June 2nd, 1997, People across the United States will recognize National Gun Violence Awareness Day and wear orange in tribute to one, Hadia Pendleton and other victims of gun violence, and two, to the loved ones of those victims. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June 2nd, the first Friday in June 2023, to help raise awareness about gun violence. And whereas by wearing orange on June 2nd, 2023, Americans will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep fire out of, firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, the town board of New, the town of Newcastle does hereby proclaim June 2nd, 2023, the first Friday in June, to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the town of Newcastle, and we encourage all residents to support efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Can I uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you, everybody.